do I start now? Welcome to you all. Welcome to our third talk from Maxine, Science Goes Public. Today we have as guest Hemal Naik with us. He is from India. He first studied in Mumbai biomedical engineering. Welcome. Sorry, we just have to. Sorry, again, we have Hemal Naik with us. He studied in India first biomedical engineering. Afterwards, he came to Munich, Bavaria, and he did his master's there in biomedical computing. Now he is since three years with us at the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior. His research, his research focuses on computer algorithms for practical applications. One of our, of our goal at Maxine since some since two years more or less and for the next years is to give also in a different insight in many cultures, old cultures, in storytelling, in religions, in fairy tailing, and um, symbolism, predictions about animals. And Hemal, with his, with his work and his focus, um, is perfect, fits perfect in this um, plan. So his concept is made more or less on three columns. One of this is to have a look on stories of the past. Um, then he um, puts them in the virtual reality and science and the connection of cold, old culture combined with new science is what he is going to tell us also about today. Hemal. I yes. would like to Hi. give over to you first of that. I would like to um, mention also that we hope that we have no technical problems today. We um, please um, send all your questions in the chat. After Tamal's talk, we will um, ask these questions to him. Okay, Tamal, go ahead. Thank you that you are Thank here you. with us. We are listening Thank you. you. Yeah. So, sacred stories from India. Uh, here, I mean, I'm going to talk mainly, I give you a sense of idea that what my concept is. I'm, uh, as Babet explained, I'm going to basically just tell stories. So, I request all the listeners to, to take these stories. And what I want you is uh, maybe to think about it. So, if, as a scientist, if I can only point one thing that uh, maybe I can give a tip to somebody is to ask questions. And uh, this has been sort of my approach for, for uh, when I read stories and when I see them. Now, uh, it's very, uh, I'm a big fan of, of, of stories and reading the literature and also these stories, how they connect people and how do they change behavior? How do we, how do these stories, uh, affect us and how how do we change our lifestyle based on them so this talk is just purely dedicated for the love of a good story and when we wonder about stories where this culture comes from because humans have stories from long time in the past that we have been developing and telling each other and one of the first ones as you see here uh, could be from from these kind of stories conveyed through paintings and art where people took inspiration from nature and draw something uh, and start creating things around because you observe that's that's the only thing that you could observe around yours and of course many people in europe and india know about 
So in India, people know about Panchatatra in Europe, about the one on the right. Both the places uh, or any culture in, in human civilization have different times. We have seen uh, artistically portrayed stories with fables where animals take, take form of humans or behave like humans or they are involved with, as, a, as a character. Sometimes these stories pass on good lessons, like in Panchatatra, for example, that they were created by Vishnu Sharma to pass on good morals and examples, something that you learn from. So if we look at, at a story at a broad point of view, when, when we pass on these stories, we are actually cre keeping this culture alive and some stories which live and some stories didn't, don't. And clearly, these ones with animals have lived very long. Also, in the past, we have seen that, uh, uh, and, and we even still do this, when we see an animal, or if it's a dog or a cat, if it's a pet, pet animal or a wild animal, we somehow try to anthropomorphize it. So we try to give human qualities or try to imagine animals as humans. And it's a sort of reflection of, ourse of ourselves and then put them in form of stories and art forms. Also, back in the days when we didn't have much technologies, in ancient time, people used uh, animals as symbolism. So here you can see a few examples. Turn their their powers. Uh, the the animals turned into gods or or godlike figures, and their powers or the, the the their power turned into their hidden secret power that they could give to their worshippers and followers. So there are various ideas uh, around these uh, these kind of uh, stories. Now, if we see more potently that there were some religions in, especially in Asia, and now I come to the Indian point, that uh, many religions start from this very base that all animals are equal. That meaning that gave same status to a human, to a lion or a leopard or any other animal. And, and this sort of started reflecting in the stories too, because then you would see a lot of stories from all these different religions coming in which you have gods associated with animals or god animals being vehicle of gods. Several animals are considered very important or sacred in many, many religions. And I always wonder, or I think everyone maybe at some point wonders that how do these relationships come into picture? So when do we see, we see, for example, here are some other Examples of Hindu gods where we see snake, cow, lion, elephant, owl. Where do all these animals come from? If these stories, because some of these, most of these stories are were first passed on from the ancient times verbally, and then they were written down, and then they were sort of kept in the same form. However, being a scientist, you might want to argue, irrespective of keeping the debate if you follow the faith or not, that if there is a story, then somebody definitely created it or it, it morphosized into this form that it is right now. And it is very interesting then to ask some questions like why did they select a specific animal? Or is it something with related to this animal back in the days when we, they actually made this story or they came up with this story? Because somebody must have invented it, right? It's the same with how does this animal fare in that society after such stories become popular. That's also interesting to see that how then it carried on further in generation and generations and so forth. And what is the status of those right now? So these are just general questions that I think when I tell you these stories, which I'm going to start from the next slide, I want to keep you in mind and maybe make up your own opinion about it. Maybe next time you come up across a new story, try to think about it and try to see how, because there could be a lot of reasons to it. 
whereas sometimes or many times i think if one follows literature and uh, it can be argued that the animals were definitely useful and very and many civilizations understood this importance of keeping animals and living in harmony with them in order to successfully survive as humans as well and therefore they started putting these animals into the stories however that's a that's going to be a long discussion and further books and books so i will i will first touch upon a story which uh, i think many 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 people in india know as uh, kids so i don't actually remember when somebody told me this story first time but i just know this that i always know this and this story is of ganesha so on the left you see an elephant and on the right you see a so see the ganesha with a human form and the elephant head so the first story which because i know the audience has uh, as is a international crowd and and uh, therefore i'm going to say it because a lot of people in india already know it so here we go with it so the story of birth of ganesha i feel is very interesting one because this story itself uh, sort of formulates this idea that the questions that i asked you before so the story in a nutshell goes something like this that one day the goddess parvati she created a human form from a clay and because she had the superpowers she gave it a human form so she breathed life into that clay model and that became that she accepted her as her son then when she wanted to go for bathing she told her son to keep watch on the door and not let anyone else in now when the husband of parvati lord shiva he came to the house he was not let in by this boy who did not know that parvati and shiva are husband and wife and he protested shiva to get inside however shiva being shiva the lord almighty he got very angry and when he got very angry he used his uh, his weapon and took off the head of the little boy when parvati came out she saw this boy dead and then she got really angry on shiva and then she told him to restore the life of the boy now shiva sent his ganas which is his followers to earth and he told them that find any animal that is looking towards the north side and give me its head the ganas went to the earth and first animal that they found looking towards the north direction was an elephant so they took off the head of this elephant came back gave it to shiva and then shiva put this head back on the lifeless body of the human form and thus starts the story of ganesha now this story as i said lot of children learn from their parents this story has has been central point of the ganesha has incredible amount of following in india and millions and millions of people and there is a day dedicated to ganesha on tuesday millions and millions of people visit it's their ritual to visit a temple every tuesday so such kind of faith is devoted to this god however this god primarily is a half elephant half human of course once the birth story came then there came many stories here uh, there are some scriptures that i have put for some of the stories where for example ganesha is writing writing one of the epic poem mahabharata or or many other rituals that followed one of the very interesting thing here to look at is that the whole whenever um the the prayer spot uh, to ganesha is actually basically attributing to the qualities of of an elephant like animal because it starts with the uh, vakrakunda mahakaya surya koti samaprabha nirviknam kurume deva sarva karya susharvada so it's a uh, it's a prayer in sanskrit which actually means uh, that oh lord ganesha please remove the obstacles 
in front of me. So please remove the obstacles that will come and stop my, uh, uh, hinder my life or something like this. And, and this is where, this is where it's uh, interesting because then also in all the pictures that you see, every aspect of Ganesha has a message involved. Of course, there is a 10 day festival dedicated for to Ganesha, which uh, you can see here the, for the scale, the Ganesha is just as big as the building nearby and you have to bring a crane to actually move it. Here you see another picture of Ganesha riding the Hanuman, the monkey god. Here you see thousands and thousands of people and these scenes you can see every year in various parts of the country. And something like this, where the festival, in the beginning, people bring the Ganesha home or outside their apartments. And after 10 days, they put this giant uh, murti, it is called, in the sea. And this is how people celebrate it. Now, if I go back to the question, now that you know the story, it is a very interesting one that why would they choose elephant? However, uh, we know from back in the time, from the records, that there was also a lot of science uh, around animal husbandry at that point of time. We can find written records from 200 BC and before, where there were records on how to how to have a, how to domesticate an elephant or how to domesticate a horse. On the right hand side in the picture here, you see uh, the stone carvings of actually a war happening. Uh, or a war gathering. So we know that elephants were important in the ancient times and people used them for different reasons. This could be one of the reasons to actually involve it in the mythological stories. However, we don't know, right? But of course, with elephants being a part of this story has changed tremendously how the elephant is perceived in this part of the country and other Asian countries because of the Ganesha, the following, it is definitely one can argue that it has helped a lot in conservation. So of course, on one hand here, I'm showing some pictures of uh, elephants being used in a festival or elephants being used outside temples. Now one could argue, or or it's, it's not on, on terms of arguing as well, that there are these animals which are captured, domesticated and kept in solitary confinements, which are social, which is not right. We are not talking on those aspects in this talk, but rather the generally perception of a lot of followers, they do look at the animal with, with a certain empathy and they always try or the general notion is towards protection of the animal and therefore probably India takes a lot of effort in terms of leading the global charge if it's against animal poaching or animal uh, um, uh, stopping uh, or the killing of elephants for their tusks. However, these stories have survived from thousands of years and gave us a lot of um, material, but, uh, but what we end up having is that uh, we have a conflicting situation nowadays, right? So this is the aspect where we pose ourselves questions that how uh, uh, elephants now the population of India is increasing and a lot of uh, lot of forests are being lost and then the elephants don't have place to move around. So this is a worry that we are facing right now. However, uh, it's a food for thought definitely from the context size that how how much the story helps and keeps helping the elephants because they are definitely. Uh, one of the top priorities and they are also a heritage animal of India. So in the in the positive note that there are still attempts being going on towards towards uh, saving the animal and keeping the habitat intact. On the left hand side you are seeing one of the pictures from a school in Jharkhand where kids are drawing. So kids are being educated upon upon uh, the, the life of the elephant and how uh, it is being a trouble. However, moving on from, from the sacred story angle, that this is some story that I is we don't know the origin and therefore we can't discuss much about, right? However, let me move on to a second story where we sort of know the origin 
and and i will i will tell how this has impacted life of the animal itself and the life of people and here i'm going to talk about a very specific community so black buck is an animal which is uh, found in throughout the india it's an it's like a gazelle which is an endemic species but this one is endemic to india it can be found in early 16th century paintings or you here you can see black buck riding a chariot of moon god um, black buck was also one of the popular uh, used prey for for cheetahs so before cheetahs became extinct from india asiatic cheetahs they used to have have uh, for a king they used to organize uh, a hunting event where they would bring a uh, a cheetah and let it hunt a black buck however these are stories uh, from the past uh, the the story that is very interesting in case of this animal is about bishnoi community so on the left here you see guru jambeshwar he was a he was a person born in a royal family in rajasthan which is in eastern part of india and he started his own sect so it's a sub religion you can call it of hinduism which is called bishnoism where uh, he, he had 29 rules or he laid out 29 rules that any follower must follow and this community has grown a lot uh, since the time that he started it and one of the central points of the community is to be in harmony with nature being in harmony with nature not cutting trees and not harming animals rather protecting animals in context of black buck it is uh, it is very special because when the the guru jambeshwar ji it is said that when he died before dying he had said to his followers that he will reincarnate as a black buck and therefore they are fierce protectors of black buck and this community has been advocating protection measures against the black buck since times since last 500 years so this we know as a as a it, it is said in story form but we know that there was a person who came up with a idea of protecting nature understanding the consequences of destroying it and rather allowing uh, the followers to actually lead to a new path what it led to was one of the biggest movements uh, which was later called chipko movement also was that in somewhere in 1730s uh, amrita devi was a woman who belonged to this bishnoi community now one day the king sent his uh, soldiers to cut some trees uh cut the kejri trees which are considered sacred by vishnois but also provide staple food for the black bucks so when they decided to to destroy these trees uh the woman came in between and was willing to chop her head off so the soldiers killed her followed following to that they killed the three daughters as well which you can see in the picture but further on uh there were 300 more people from the village who came and refused to bend to the wills of the king and were ready or gave their lives already to the hands of soldiers and then the king realized his mistake so this is environmentalism where people are taking action like what we see fridays for future or something like this in a modern term that people who live in synchrony with the nature taking steps to protect the nature so i think uh, in terms of bish noise again we come uh, as i said that if we come back to the why why would they have designed such rules like that and this is a very interesting question because the the jambeshwar guruji himself the the leader of the sect of course he may not have direct idea of of him reincarnating as as the animal but 
the way the story portrays it makes the followers believe it and not only believe it but actually follow it and these followers from last 500 years so here we see the power of a story that how if if there is a good message or if there is a direct connection between the actions and repercussions then some stories make a very long lasting impact and this is one of the examples and this is something very recent for example just yesterday i read about or today i read about a news where two men here i'm showing in the picture are from this community they're 15 year old and they took on four armed poachers uh, during the corona lockdown which was just uh, this event happened on 10th may so you can see how these communities are living not only in harmony with nature but also fiercely protecting even at the cost of their lives and this is some very interesting factor which a story brings in where the animal and the humans are connected and because of the sacred nature of the animal they are protected so as gandhi said be the change you want to see in the world i move on to the next phase of the story which is the modern story i call it or i would like to call it that story something which is unwritten uh, or half written because uh, this is where i want to lead to an example where i think we in the as in the ancient times when we used the uh, from ganesha's example when we have no law on um, no very uh, fixed idea on how the story came to be but it has been with people for so long in case of black box we know a different story where there is some kind of logic involved uh but now we come to this new phase where i'm trying to show that how science is contributing in creating new traditions new ideologies and also uh having a cultural movement and for this i will move on to story of amur falcons so the story i will give you a first background because there is a background on the story and then a specific part which i will mention about a very very small village i was fortunate enough in two years ago to go to this place and meet the people uh, and interact with them this therefore this comes from more a personal side so as a background what happened in this area is as i'm showing in the box that here is india and then you see bangladesh and myanmar and here is the region where we would like to go right uh this is a broad idea of how the place looks like it has most uh, greenery green states in india and uh, vast and vast forest is just like this in hills where you can just see nothing but forest so what happened was in 2013 there was started a news coming out that in india in nagaland in these areas a lot of amur falcons were being trapped and killed and captured by the local people who are these local people so these local people have always from long long time lived in different kind of tribes which still exist a nagaland state has 17 tribes manipur state has 29 tribes they are hunters and warriors since long time so killing wild animals wild birds has been part of the tradition from long long time there was some conflict because of the britishers and economic development is not done so much however these people also have their own rules about maintaining uh, maintaining the forests they have their own ideas of how they protect the forest protect the animals and this is they they have an have a concept of their own where they part of the forest is governed by themselves now here in this particular area which it looks like people were doing farming fishing hunting that's but the practices had become unsustainable by that time so then there was a study on migration of the amur falcons because before 2010 
there was not even any idea. So that where, how, there was a rough idea that Mahmur Falcons migrate from India to Africa. However, which route they are taking was not known. And certainly it was not known that how many numbers they are gathering in the part of Manipur or, or Nagaland. So when they went to the place like this, which is this valley in Nagaland near the Doyang Dam, the researchers, so after the news that came out where a lot of animals were being killed, the research team was sent by the Indian government to look into the matter and to see what is actually happening. And there was a lot of conservation effort, but this is something that they found there, that in this valley, you have, nobody knows how many, but could be about a million or even more birds coming and roosting there. And they had absolutely no idea. So I'm going to play a little bit of picture video to just give the immensity of the situation. And this behavior was not recorded before or not known before. If the birds were coming there from 2000 or even before, nobody actually knows if this actually happened or not. So this got curiosity of scientists. And then they learned that actually there was about, then they learned that the falcons were actually coming to eat the termites because there were so many termites taking up to wings in this particular season so after the monsoon so that is october and september the termites come out and when the termites come out at the same time all these falcons arrive from siberia and then they make this whole journey to south africa so this was something that they figured out for the first time and from Nagaland, when the scientists went for the first time, they tagged a few birds with GPS sensors. And then they showed they were able to confirm the, the idea that they were, the birds were not only traveling along the sea, which is one of the longest sea route migration. It takes about when they start from northeast of India and reach the Horn of Somalia, it takes about five days eight hours of non-stop flight. And this whole migration route from Siberia to South Africa is about 22,000 kilometers. So this is the extent at which these animals are traveling. And they started, the scientists started a new concept where they started, so you see names of birds here. These names are uh, names of the villages and the tribes. And this is something was done to push the conservation efforts, push the conservation efforts to tell birds are making very, very long journeys and you should not kill, kill them. Meanwhile, when at this site, all these activities are happening, there was another corner in Manipur where people also started to get together and to protect the birds started the movement. And they had organized the first time a tag satellite tagging event in 2018 where we were invited. So this is where uh, I would like to take you to. And when we went there, there are, for example, lot of open, scientifically open questions about the species that we don't know how do they exactly arrive? How do they exactly depart? What is their behavior in the morning? How do they make the oceanic journey? What do they feed on? How do they locate termites? Um, so many questions, but we don't know. So let me take you to Tamenglong now. And this is something that you would see on an average on when they arrive in the valley. Now this could be some 40, 50,000 birds, uh, which you can see here on the screen. And they move around like this throughout the day, eating termites, and then leave after three or four weeks. So 
this is the theme I at this point I would like to mention that uh, Dr. Suresh Kumar from WII and his uh, colleagues from Hungary Peter and Pala and Sophie these guys have worked on this project from last four years so the tagging that I showed before from Nagaland that was on also these animals uh, sorry also these researchers and uh, the tagging that is being done now in Manipur this which is the other state is also these researchers these guys have started this whole momentum this whole idea of doing science and science-based conservation and really push this project ahead working with the communities working with the local people this is where also i would like to contribute uh, like to mention uh, contributions from arun rs who is a district forest officer from the indian government who has worked quietly in the rem this remote corner for last five years continuously to create awareness about the amul falcons and their migration and to put the effort to stop the killings there so when we reached there first the idea was to do the satellite tagging we would tag five birds but we could not get five birds because we could get five birds but the tags were not working so then we could only put tags on two different birds which male and female you see here one is called tameglong name based on the name of the district and the other one was called Manipur that's the name of the state and these two birds were the first birds tagged in the region for the first time this was done with help of local people and with local people these people that you see there they help throughout the day to throughout those days to set up camp for the researchers to work with them in the fields to start design strategies to capture the birds and finally therefore they were included also in the process where we release the birds because at the end of the day it's not only scientists who do the work or all the work you need help of people and you need that kind of commitment for example here before releasing one of the birds one of the forest officers offered a prayer and here you can see that where science meets faith because of course you may have your own arguments uh, the people uh, who live there uh, they are they have followed their traditions from long long time and even though they are doing the scientific activity the prayer is just for the safe return of the bird because of course nobody knows what happens to the bird so they were enthusiastic and since they were these first birds leaving the village they were super enthusiastic on on keeping connection with them because then they could actually track them as well for example one of the villages in the area has has declared itself as a amur falcon village because they want to identify with these birds and not identify as the village which is uh, destroying the eco uh, stopping the birds from the migratory path of course as i mentioned before here we were part of the fourth amul falcon festival so this was the biggest surprising moment for me that there was a festival organized to celebrate a scientific activity so the forest officers worked together with the local communities to generate awareness and invited local politicians to come over and and speak about conservation and to celebrate this activity that we tag the birds today and release them we had children from schools coming over and performing their traditional dances where they showed us a part of their culture and in the background of course if you look above in the sky you will always see armor falcons flying around now the community has taken new ideas uh, to support themselves because earlier they were killing a lot of birds to support themselves by economically earning money 
but now people think ecotourism may be a better option and they've started opening watchtowers. When we were lucky enough to see the, tra the traditional uh, rituals happening and the traditional prayers happening at the same time, where people took this as an opportunity to come together and celebrate as a tribe. And there were different rituals performed to create not only the awareness, but create this environment where not only the birds are celebrated, but it's also taken as an event. This picture is particularly, you see, the, the women came up with the Amur Falcon step even, the dance step because they, earlier they performed a dance which was called Hologibbon dance, which is based on another ape species that is found in the area. So they are using their old culture or cultural norms, which they associated with many animals or dances or colors. And now they've started involving this new animal. Of course, this cannot be done without public awareness. So while conducting the scientific activity, the scientists and the forest officials were also enthusiastically conveying this to the state uh, audience where in the newspapers and the other places where they mentioned. Uh, as I mentioned, for, so this was when the event took place, one of the one of the ministers, the environment minister of the state himself came to the village, which had never happened before. And he inaugurated the watchtowers. He helped, uh, he gave gifts uh, to the people. And this political will is required to show to people that such their efforts are being seen and their efforts are being repaid with, uh, with a lot of encouragement and they are not just a blip somewhere on the map, but they're actually putting this place on the visibility of a global map where people from all over the world are learning about what these people are doing. The kids are excited that people are coming to the town. As you can see here, San scientists, on, which is uh, usually you don't see this happening as a life of scientists, but people are willing or you're treated as a celebrity where people want to take selfies with you and they come forward to chat with you. I think it's a very interesting time for in the story if we see about these kids where they grow up celebrating a festival about a bird, especially based on the theme that actually the bird was tagged for a scientific purpose and that's why we celebrated it. So I think it is a completely different form that this place is taking. However, unfortunately, one of the birds was hunted down because hunting is still not completely curved there. And year after year, more efforts have to be put there. That year, when the bird was hunted down, they declared uh, politically, uh, the, the minister declared that they should take away the weapons for the hunting and also try to encourage people to not get into such activities again. There was quick action taken on the ground where the guns from the particular village were seized and action was taken directly on the ground. And this cannot be done without active, active involvement of people who really want to bring the change. As you can see here, the, the media keeps following up when the birds are coming, when the birds are going, and this has created this cycle of information transfer which keeps happening just by following the movement of the animals. So the Tamenglong was also lost in Zambia somewhere. So the two first birds tagged in 2018, both were lost. However, they tagged some animals last year again. And if you follow the Facebook page of Tamenglong Forest Division, you can see regular updates of these birds. Uh, what are they doing? Uh, which place they are at? So currently, as we speak, almost all the birds have finished the return journey. One of the famous birds is uh, called Long Lang. Long Lang has been tagged in Nagaland and Long Lang finished his seventh journey this year. And this has been one of the longest running 
GPS recorded data of this particular bird Amur falcons achieved. So here in with this story what I wanted to say was that how we are now writing new stories with science as a base and how we are creating awareness or creating new traditions with scientific ideas at its core by showing people how incredible these animals are when they are able to make such long journeys or how incredible phenomenon it is that someone like Lang Long Lang, a very small bird, could make such journey year after year again and again. And I think science had that power. Here you can have a look at the small movie that I made on the topic. If you want, it's called Magic in Manipuri Sky. It's freely available on YouTube. You can also contact me for questions regarding that. And I think I would like to finish the talk with a, just a brief idea of the atmosphere of uh, the difficulties that come in the field while working on such topics. So on that note, I would like to thank you all and end my talk. And uh, yeah open for taking questions from the Maxine side. Thank you very much, um, talk. I was really impressed, starting from Ganesha, which is also we have you talk on Tuesday on the Ganesha day, which was not in, oh, um, yeah, was not mentioned, not meant like that, or we didn't it in purpose. And also, I'm sure my mother will think like that. <laughs> also very impressive, the five days non-stop flights of the Falcons. And also your last story is a wonderful combination of old culture and science. I really were, were very, very nice and very special. Yeah, I think it's also something which may be might happen or happened to some people also more during the Corona view, um, um, time now that they made new experiences also with animals because we humans were a little more in the background. And now I hope we have some, I know we have some listeners out there and I hope we get some questions. I can't see at the moment any questions. Um, so I would please, if you have questions, put them now in the chat. Should I stop Somebody... scaring my screen? Sorry? Or should I stop sharing the screen or I keep sharing, showing the video, whatever it's now. You can keep showing the video, I think. Okay. Um, so. I, I, I'm curious. I have one question. Where's the Ganesha festival? Uh, where or when? Where is it in? in... Where? It, it's in many, many parts, many, many parts of India. But the pictures that you saw were mainly for Mumbai, where I grew up. Uh, because I think in Maharashtra, the, the celebration is really big. Uh, of course, other parts of the country as well. But this particular, it has also its own uh, own roots. Uh, for example, during the independence time, one of the freedom fighters of India uh, used the event of Ganesha festival as an activity to unite people. And I think that also later on gave rise to this new wave of celebrating in a very, very large, large format. Because earlier, even though people would celebrate it, people would bring small Ganesha at home and put them in the tent, uh, in the ponds after three days or ten days. But these big, big uh, statues is definitely part of a community-driven event because then you have a reason to bring the community together. People come, meet together, go to different uh, areas of the city to see different Ganeshas and so on. Mm -hmm. And I have now one more question from the audience. Mm -hmm. Are you working on further projects in cooperation with India? 
Uh, yes, so currently we are waiting for a project. So Amur Falcon project is something that we will work on in the long term uh, with Max Planck because uh, we are we have a collaboration with the researchers that I mentioned and uh, and we want to tag uh, put the Icarus tags which is another technology that that is space based uh, uh, tracking of animals that we've developed so I think we will work on that. Me personally, I have applied for another project on actually black box, in the part of the story too. So if the project uh, goes through successfully, then we would be able to work with black box, and that's where I would really like to uh, get in touch with this community and and try to replicate the model of the falcons, where we can actually do a science project and at the same time use the community's reach to bring out some cultural message as well. Another question. So is there a collective effect or just the, or just the termites? Uh, it's, we don't know. Uh, actually, I mean, it's, it's mostly looks like it's just the termites. Uh, there is no emergent behavior that one could see. However, uh, there the problem is that what it's difficult to find the events when they are eating termites and the numbers of the falcons are just so huge that observation becomes very challenging. So I myself would not make any any big statement, uh, but I do think that there is interesting behaviors to be uncovered because they I've also been to Hungary and red-footed falcons. Uh, they are sister species of Amur falcons, and both of them go to Africa. Uh, however, the aggregations that they do that I've learned from other scientists are a bit different. The Amur falcons hang around the roosting spot in the morning quite a lot, and then they leave. Uh, so to answer the question directly, I uh, don't know. Okay. Could be. Another question is, can you explain again what happened after the one tag Amor Falcon was hunted and killed? Yeah, it's uh, very interesting. So we, our plan was uh, to tag for five days, but we tagged in two days. So we went back to the city and the next day, the forest officer got a call that one of the village leaders so these villages function in a way that each wither each village has a village chief and uh, he usually manages the issues of the village so some person who might have hunted the bird um, because after hunting the bird they of course bring them home and want to do whatever with them but that person found a tag and that person was honest enough to go to the village chief and give the tag. And then the village chief got in touch with the local politician. The local politician called the forest officer and we were able to retrieve the tag back as well uh, on this term. So it is not that people destroyed it, but that's how we recovered the tag. So it has its own drama story at that time at least. Okay. That some tags have interesting stories behind how they travel. Yeah, yeah. And other, this is more a go black book, black buck um, project. Uh huh. So, so go for it. I think that's what meant. And then I have another question: Is there a change in the stories, inherent narration, when the origin switched from religion to science? And if yes. What do you think did change? Did... Can you can you repeat that question? Is there a inherent? Is there a change in okay. the stories, inherent okay. narration, mm -hmm. when the religion switched from religion to science? Uh, and if yes, what do you think did changed? Uh, I think the way I understand the question is that is the narrative changing after a while from religious to scientific? Uh, 
I think it may be the other way around. I uh, I won't be surprised. The, I don't know. I mean, now the record keeping is pretty well, but uh, let's say this whole Amur Falcon thing, who knows, after 500, 600 years, if the story still lives, uh, it might be just converted to some powerful bird, uh, which hopefully not, because the science uh, will survive. But I think... I think the the question other way around is is interesting that if the story uh, had a oh yeah now I get it actually so if the story had a scientific origin at what point it gets a religious tone to it and for if the story's intention was scientific in the first place um, I don't know uh, but I would I would argue so there is. Uh, what I was reading and when I learned more about this topic is this book called Sacred Animals of India and and what I learned that there are a lot of uh, one could only draw logic that why would a certain community pray to a certain animal as a god uh, there are logic that kind of logic can be found in Mayans for example the in Mexico or South America or all big tribes that can be found that when they were passed on uh, maybe that there was some logic in that however yeah i mean stories i think uh, evolve in their own shape and uh, i there is uh, there is a difference also between written and uh, i think written and uh, spoken stories so the stories of ganesha for example are first spoken and then written and therefore it could have taken many forms in between however the the other stories are more if they are written form then less prone to changes um, and also i believe that uh, yeah i mean uh, otherwise i don't know if science takes religious form later on like it's it's hard to see now because in back in the days nobody called science science as well uh, i mean it is a kind of a knowledge yes but not as we call modern science. Uh, but it would be interesting to see how mo modern scientific findings, if they at all get a religious tone in future. Well, no idea. Interesting yeah, I'm question. Not, I'm also not very sure how the question is meant because for, yeah. it's more from religion to science, but I, I think also you are right. Sometimes it might be also with the Maya or the Aztecs, there might be before a kind of science because they were very scientific already. So maybe, yeah, so we know both ways, maybe exactly because we, I mean, we can't this, uh, we always try to compare it with modern science, but we think that there was a lot of knowledge in all the other tribes with which they achieve uh, great uh, achievements, right? Like Mayan built the pyramids. Even in the ancient India, when if you see still see some of the temples, it's beautiful work of architecture. Now, uh, that does require some kind of skill, some kind of math, some kind of idea of weight and proportions and balancing, and that we call modern science architecture now. But so that kind of shows that, and I'm pretty sure the observation based uh, usage of uh, that's how the medicine used for plants come, right? That you do experimentation enough so that you know which plant works as medicine for which disease. Uh, this specifically, this region, for example, the, the, the Nagaland, Manipur, or the northeast of India, people have excellent knowledge of the forest. Uh, if you go in with them, they know the trees, they know the animals, they know how to how to avoid certain animals and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, yeah, that knowledge may not be categorized or by the definitions of this modern textbook science, but in its own, the knowledge is, is to a certain right, uh, learned through, through practices, which may be scientific in their own nature. So, yeah. The one who asked is bringing an input again here. The teller of the story is now told from another source. It's what I meant. 
So no science tells stories. That is true. That, that's the end of your the Amor Falcon story, what you tell or told uh -huh. also. Or I hope we understood this now. Yeah, I'll have to look at it later. Right now yeah. it's weird because I can only yeah. look at this. Yeah. Uh, this also for me a little bit. So there's yeah. another question. How did you get from computing to birds? Uh, I just, uh, in, in a very small nutshell, in 2013, I went uh, on a trip to Himalayas and I met a elderly gentleman. Uh, Mike, uh, and he took me on a bird watching trip, and I was fascinated to see all the diversity of birds that existed in India. And uh, and I just, uh, I think since that day, I'm pretty much doing birding sig significantly more and more every year. And that at some point led me to ask that what can I use my skills in to sort of work more towards uh, wildlife. Uh, and that's how I turned from computer science to behavior studies. And luckily at this institute, we use a lot of technology to, to study animals. So that's how it fits in. And luckily on this institute, we have people like you that also see it from the other side. It's very nice combination, both of things. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's great to have such an atmosphere. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I think we go yeah. to the end as I don't see any more questions at the moment, Thanks. but um, I would, um, we would love um, to hear more from also the last question was, which, which was a little mm -hmm. un unsolved maybe. Um, just tell us our sto your stories or share some, mm, some um, old cultures, um, which you know, which deal with with um, animals or have animals somehow in in their um, in their history. We would really love to have your input, comments, and whatever. Also, again, discussing these questions which we had here. Um, you can either put comments on our YouTube channel or um, send them via email. And we hope also that the technical problems, we are a little sorry about that, um, but I think we managed them. And thank you again, Hemal, for this thank really you. nice talk. I would mention, would like to mention again that we have Tuesdays, always 7 p.m. This talks German time. And we would also love if you like to share global with your families, whatever, um, um, this time that we meet here and have nice talks. The next talk is in German again. We do the talks in the original language. We won't translate it like we do some, sometimes in reality. Here we won't do this. So either German, either English, maybe, maybe you have to do it also one time in Spanish, I don't know. And next talk is from Dr. Wolfgang Fiedler from also our institute. And, and the title is 500 Tech White Storks and what is their, what are their stories? It's a German talk, like I said. If you like to, one thing I um, have to mention again is um, if you like to chat, I think you have to um, subscribe in our channel. So if you are more often with us, please do so and have a nice evening. Thank you all of you.